I'd just like to welcome everyone to part two of the Siemens seminar series. Um, Pete Chuali will deliver a um, really insightful presentation um, regarding the fly-in, fly-out nuclear medicine services that he offers in Western Australia in the remote communities. I think he should be congratulated on the work that he's been doing uh, for, for many, many years um, over in the West, um, trying to deliver um, equity um, to all Australians, um, but particularly those uh, vulnerable Australians in uh, rural and remote regions of uh, Western Australia. Obviously confronted some challenges in recent times, um, particularly uh, in 2018 and 19 with the molybdenum crisis and now more recently with the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Peter. Um, before he um, starts his presentation, really want to thank Siemens uh, for jumping on board and sponsoring this six-part series. Um, really appreciated. Um, it means that we can deliver um, during these unusual circumstances um, some really um, good CPD opportunities um, for our RAINS members um, and our non-RAINS members as well um, and uh, without, uh, without charge. So um, it's a really good opportunity um, for us to be able to um, deliver to you, but we couldn't do it without our um, uh, commercial partners. And, uh, and we really do appreciate um, Siemens coming on board and supporting this series. So without um, further delay, um, I pass over to Pete and uh, enjoy your um, uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, um, no doubt Pete's available to answer them either online or um, later via um, Rain's Facebook discussion. Uh, look, firstly, thanks, um, thanks everybody for their interest. I'd like to thank Siemens and Chris uh, to support this for Rain's, which is great. I know it's a bit late for you uh, guys over, over east. Uh, and I will excuse if you hear a noisy seven-year-old running around and their dog, and they've just got home from soccer training. Um, and I'll also just like, it's just for our Melbourne colleagues and Victorian colleagues, just want to extend my sympathies for what's happening with you guys at the moment. It's, it's a terrible situation. I hope, uh, I hope your mental health um, stays intact. Uh, and if anything, we could all do to help support you at all, let us, let us know. Um, I'm just, this, this presentation is uh, less about well, you know, we certainly will go through the logistics of what we do, but, but particularly also just the context of why we do it. Um, you know, the Bush nuclear medicine has been a feature of my life for 21 years now, and it's been one of the most professionally gratifying parts of my professional career, <laughs> also the most exhausting, and the one that's put most of the grey hair on the side of the years. Um, I, I have my company now, which I've turned into a B Corp, which is a, just basically against... Um, uh, sort of shareholder capitalism, a sort of stakeholder capitalism. So we're a locally invested business and we get um, support from Rural Health West, which is administers um, some, some dollars from the Commonwealth, which helps us keep our heads as well. Um, the reason I got into this was because of this, this guy uh, who was a radiologist I met at a conference in 1994 in Imperial College. And he, um, uh, after a few drinks, he convinced me to come to Western Australia and I did. His name was a Dr. Johnny Walker. And if you spent a day with him, you'd, you'd be addicted to Johnny Walker just to get through um, because he was a high, high performance fellow. But he pretty much was the godfather of teleradiology, I think, um, in Western Australia, at least. And this was our network um, that we, we had in place. And basically, um, I think this was the most uh, diffuse teleradiology network. And, and if you're looking closely, you probably can't see, but we had links that were... <laughs> We thought were great at 128k. So some older people on the on the um, on the on the Zoom will, will sort of remember this sound. I don't know if you can hear it, but the old modem sound that that we used to um, used to play, uh, and, and we know when we've got connections. And this is how we distributed radiology around um, the whole of Western Australia. Anyway, so Johnny <laughs> used to like to advertise the fact that he was reporting his nukes and ultrasound and radiology off, off his laptop on top of the Range Rover with the background of yelling up beach. Um, and sometimes he did. Um, but we, we, I think he was a bit of a trailblazer and I was very happy to sort of um, follow his coattails. We, we, were, we started down here in Manger. I'm talking to you from Perth, but we started in Manger and then we had Bunbury. And then we took contracts, uh, radiology contracts around the place. And then we picked up this one in Kalgoorlie, which is a big gold mining centre, um, a good 600, 700 kilometres, uh, 600 kilometres from, from Perth. Um, and he said, Pete, you know, in his 
he had a worse sort of jingoistic accent than I did. But he said, you know, mate, we should, we should put nuclear men up in Kalgoorlie. And I said, mate, you're nuts. It's in the middle of nowhere. But he said, look, we should give it a crack. So we did that. And, and this, is, this is the, uh, the Kalgoorlie region. And flying in the Kalgoorlie is always, I think, a beautiful sort of a moonscape uh, environment. That's the largest whole open cut mine in Australia. That's the super pit which pumps out a lot of West Australia's GDP. Um, and you've just got nothing outside the local engram. So when, when we started nuclear medicine in the bush, um, it was quite an affront, if you like, to the regulators at the time, because we had these standards um, and you had to have a nuclear medicine physician present. And we got a lot of, we got a lot of pushback um, from uh, it. We, well, we had to satisfy the state regulations, but then we had to go on satisfying um, uh, the Australian Association of Nuclear Medicine Decisions. And so we, we got through it, but basically remoteness was, you know, 200 kilometres away from a proposed nuclear medicine practice. So it was a, quite a bizarre sort of terminology, but I remember having to front up with, um, with some other guys, some other decisions to just sort of um, demonstrate the need for nuclear medicine out in those country areas and also an exemption from the particular rules. Um, but these recommendations really haven't changed since 92, and I, um, but it's sort of become a little bit redundant since. But it was hard, hard slog to start off with. Interesting, because Laura Skelly, who some of you may know, I know Jeff knows, um, did a look into advanced practice, but part of that was to see what sort of on-site decisions were necessary. And almost 28% of, of practices now don't have a decision on-site um, at all, at least based on the 50, I think 50 or so practices that she uh, looked into. Uh, and 28% sort of sometimes, and then a lot had the sort of traditional model. But it's become more over time, the growth sector where, where nuclear medicine uh, technologists have been working more independently than, and, and more autonomously than ever. So this is uh, some beautiful shots. I ripped off the, uh, the tourism videos, uh, uh, sites, I should say. Um, and it's got nice big broad sheets, uh, sheets streets in Kalgoorlie, uh, ostensibly because back in the day they had to get the big uh, camel uh, road trains uh, doing a U-turn. Um, that's the, I think that's a bit apocryphal. It was also because they had ambitions to make it look like Paris, apparently, when they designed it. This pub here, the Exchange, is the, and I've been in a lot of pubs, this, this is one of the wildest pubs in Australia, still is. Um, now they've actually got these cowboy uh, um, doors that open in and out and you see people flying out of it. But it's, uh, it's, it's a, it is the wild west out there. There's a lot of people with gold fever and it's a town that I've, I've become very, very fond of. But just 10 kilometres outside of that is the uh, Indigenous Aboriginal camps. Um, a lot of patients that we see are brought in from what we call the lands. So one of them is called um, Jinja Jarra uh, out near Warburton, which is another 600, 700 kilometres out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they choose to, to, to live in these camps. Um, they're sadly very, uh, uh, you know, very, very poor hygiene. Uh, and kids stay here sometimes, um, but it's not uncommon for us to have a lot of patients is to have the, the, you know, I think quite a nice smell of wood smoke <laughs> um, that have flown in from, from out, 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 outside for checks of generally it's renal disease associated or diabetes associated diseases and heart disease. Um, and so just, and so I just want to provide a context of why we do it and, and, and sort of inequality that exists outside of, outside of the metropolitan or the large regional centre. So, I think Jeff's seen this side before, but in Australia, we, we perform pretty well with the, with the top 12, 11 nations um, in, in terms of the bang for the buck, and the spending and, and the performance. Um, but we don't rate so well in equity. So um, interestingly, in the, U in the UK, we have has, a, has an overall anchor ranking of one. So it's got good equity, good administration, good access, but actually healthcare right, outcomes come out at 10. I don't know how they work that out, but means you, you, you leave hospital, you leave a healthcare system um, sicker than you would in, the, in, in, in Australia. But in any event, we don't rank too badly overall, but we certainly have poor equity. Um, not a politician that I would readily subscribe to, but when she said this, which is in a, a maiden speech, which is in relation to the fact that your, your life uh, survival and mortality and morbidity rates are really dependent upon your geography, uh, your postcode, and also how much, how much is in your wallet. Um, uh, and it still shouldn't, I think, be the case in this day and age of the technology that we've got. But that was one of the one of the interesting things that Jackie Lampy put in her in her welfare speech. 
where I am particularly is as bad as it gets. You have a 50% lower, uh, less chance of living five years if you get prostate cancer um, in Indigenous populations. And it's, a, it's about 25 if you're not Indigenous. So it's still far below what would be experienced in Perth, um, 600 kilometres further, further down the road. Um, the, the biggest killers in terms of cancer, the lung, breast, colorectal, prostate and head and neck. Um, for Indigenous and, and non-Indigenous, you can, you can see that there. Uh, heart disease is no better. In fact, it's a lot worse. And these are, I, I have double-checked these numbers. You are 30 times more likely to have a, uh, an MI um, if you're Indigenous compared to non-Indigenous under 55. Mortality differential is significantly higher. Um, if you do survive your heart attack and you go to Perth, a lot of them just get a bag of pills, and I'm not joking, they, when they had their cat in Perth and they come back out to Kalgoorlie, and there's very little follow-up, there's very poor cardiac rehabilitation, secondary prevention strategies are non-existent, um, and there's over 250,000 um, preventable health conditions, that's nationally, but I reckon where we are in Western Australia, it takes a fair share of it. And I really believe this, you have to see it to be changed by it. And I think going through the Medicare benefits schedule review task force situation lately just highlights to me how little the bureaucrats in Canberra know how bad things are. They just do not have a, a real cognizance um, and tangible understanding of what goes on uh, in, in remote areas. And I'm talking about MM3, um, mon you know, the, the, the modified Monash model, which are quite remote. Um, and uh, it's, it's still, you know, it's very easy to become disillusioned, but you can't give up the fight. i just looking at Kalgoorlie because Kalgoorlie is the most remote site that we, we see. Um, Geraldton's probably the next most remote. But when I went up there first up in 1998, we had um, 40 GPs. Most of them were trained, Australian trained doctors. Uh, went through the train, Australian training schools. Uh, we had four resident physicians. Uh, they had very, very regular medical advisor, advisory, you know, like grand rounds. Um, we had a lot of allied health care, two radiology groups there and three resident surgeons. And fast forward 20 plus years um, and uh, we've got pretty much a complete flip. We've got 95% of the doctors, there's only uh, about 16 full-time equivalents. And of those, 95% are OTDs. So we're basically, we're drained out of the, out of the third world. Out of, most of them from Corella, a lot of them uh, from the subcontinent anyway. Um, and we've drained a lot of their best and brightest, so we're very dedicated, well-trained doctors. Um, but uh, we take them out of their environment, stick them in a very remote, hostile place like Kalgoorlie, and there's a lot of churn. They, they, once they get their, their ticket, or they get their, their fellowship, often um, will move on, so there's a lot of um, discontinuation of medical care. And mainly the reasons for this is because administration changes have occurred. And I don't want to get my blood pressure up, but in any event, there's been quite a, a significant change over the 20 years in, in the medical scene there. So what we're left with at the moment is we've got an enormous uh, geographical land space, 770,000 square kilometres. $9 billion is what it adds to the Australian economy and mineral resources in the gold fields. We've got a, um, the broader region of 60,000 people of which is quite high, 12% Aboriginal descent. So in Western Australia, totally, it's 4% populations Aboriginal. Uh, in this instance, it's 12% concentrated in the gold fields. No MRI, but it is coming. Um, there's no advanced CT. They put a new one in, but it was the lowest of the lowest. There's no cardiac CT options, for instance. No PET CT, no stress echo, no resident uh, cancer doctor, no resident orthopedic doctor, um, no resident uh, specialists, uh, like the internal physicians, fraps. Um, it's actually nine weeks to get a public ultrasound. We help with a private one. Uh, and as I said, enormous high turnover of doctors who really are coming here, uh, sort of, we, we put them out there. I think supervision is quite poor, could be better. And then they, they move on. Um, oh, and sorry. And consequently, um, we have a much higher when in doubt, fly it out model. So Royal Flying Doctor Service um, works on about, it's actually about 1800 last numbers I saw. So that's four or five patients per day have flown out. Now, back when I started in 98, there was about one or two. They were emergencies. What happens now, there's soft transfers, and I'll show you some more stats on that. Um, in any event, we've got problems. There's, 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 there's significant GP shortages. It's, it's um, one, dot, one region of 7,000 people had no doctor at all for some time. Uh, this is the, 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 the Royal Flying Doctor Service annual snapshot from 2018. And why I put this here is I just want to show you that 
Um, things like head laceration after a motor accident, uh, items such as arthritis, they were never RFDS transfers. They're what they call soft transfers. They're like lower, lower strategies. Uh, sorry, lower, lower um, medical emergencies, if they can call them that. Uh, most of that stuff used to get treated in Cal Hospital, but the model change was just to fly them all out. So the flying doctor service, understandably, need to upgrade their jets. Um, and it's more of an air ambulance, I guess, than a medical service uh, for acute uh, life-threatening disease. Um, a bit busy, but this is just to say the differential. So we in Western Australia use a lot less uh, medicines per head of population. Medicare, particularly in the regional areas, per person is, is a lot lower. Um, if you're an Aboriginal person in the regional areas, you're 15 years less likely to... to um, your, 50, your, your life expectancy is 15, 15 years less than the metropolitan uh, for male and 13 for females. Um, we have 3.6% of the state's population uh, in the regional areas who are Indigenous. Um, and yeah, we also have the worst performing um, per bang per buck health system. Um, part of that's because of the tyranny of distance, but it's not entirely that. Um, we've got a lot more administrators. So hopefully, I know you're recording this presentation, mate, but you need to exclude hospital administrators from it. Um, the uh, ischemic heart disease uh, is the killer, the biggest killer. Um, as we all know, this is back to 2007, it hasn't changed. This is for the Midwest. Um, and lung cancer and breast cancer for male and female, um, respectively, are the biggest, the biggest killers. Uh, just to also show you that in the gold fields, we have um, a rate of 55 GPs per 100,000. So usually it's one to 1,000. That's the national total. Um, or, you know, or 100 per 100,000. Uh, in, in the salubri the, uh, you know, the affluent areas of Perth, it's 172 GPs. Um, in the gold fields, it's a third of that. So it's, and it's projected to get worse. So by 2025, we're, we're going to be short by about 1,000 GPs. And they haven't really, I haven't seen any data which shows <clears throat> that that needle is going to shift anywhere soon. The reason I, I came across this paper from Laura Alston, <clears throat> who's from Deakin, and she's a dietitian that's now invested doing a PhD in a policy. <clears throat> because these things, I'm just a broken record. These, these, these health issues um, just don't shift. The, the closing the gap, if you ever take interest in that, it just doesn't change. They just move the numbers around to try and make it look less worse, but it's getting worse uh, and um, comparative to the metropolitan area. So this, and I've been enlightened by what's happened recently with the MBS review is that a lot of it comes down, sadly, to votes and, and power. Um, in, in the electrical system, electrical system. So she did a paper that was really interesting. She, she, she um, surveyed all these national uh, advisors. This is the advisors to the health ministers, state and federal. And this, this senior national policy advisor, I think I know who it is, but he basically said, look, you can do all the research you like in the bush, but it's about as, you know, it's about as effective as that into the life cycles of grasshoppers. We're not going to shift. Um, and also made the point that, Country people aren't filling our mailboxes, and I, and I agree with that. In many respects, I found some, in some res ways, I get angry at the rural people because they're just too apathetic. They just think, well, we live out here, this is just our lot in life, when it shouldn't. They should be arguing for more. But so, in some respects, they are, they are to, um, to blame, I, I say advisedly. I wish they just got a bit more angry. Um, but it, it really comes down there's no votes out in the bush, and there's no real push to change. Um, so Anyway, that's my, my little uh, political soapbox thing. What we need is, is obviously more doctors, obviously more funding, um, better ser cancer services, um, increased funding for scanners, uh, and uh, better uh, value, better, better return for patient transfer systems. And I also think there should be greater empowerment for advanced practitioner techniques. And I've spoken about this before. I think for those who want to get involved in more paramedical sides, like I've been sort of forced to over the last 25 years, the better. I think we have a lot of skill sets that can that can fill some gaps, uh, and certainly would support you know um, models of uh, of education in that regard. So I've given this talk before, um, also at the, at the Congress, but I, I gave it locally to the West Australian group. But just to point out, um, and it's not to say that we're any better than anyone in the metro sector. It's just a practical necessity that we've got to take on these roles. But in the metropolitan sites, you've obviously got decisions registrars, pharmacists, physicists. Senior doc, senior technologist, nurse, um, you do therapies, you often have PET CT and biomedical engineers, they're all there in your teaching hospital environment, in your large, 
your large, um, uh, maybe regional site, but large uh, private sites. But in the bush, you got none of it. You probably got us, um, and no, no chance having one of those fly out to Kobe early at a moment's notice. Uh, and it's more challenging out in the, in the FIFO sites because you don't. In the, compared to Metro, because Metro doesn't have the fly-up cost. So it's fly to Kalgoorlie, it's, it's about $800 return. Uh, it's been really bad, very bad, with the Qantas and Vir well, the Virgin uh, collapse. Um, so there's been occasions where we've tried to get onto some uh, uh, mining flights, uh, chartered flights. Uh, you don't have to transfer the isotopes. Um, our patients don't pay gaps, and so our costs are about 30 or 40 percent higher, and our revenue per patient is about 30 or 40 percent lower. So it's a real squeeze. So without the grants, it's it's not a viable option. So I run them just as long as they wash their face, and quite happy with that. Um, just back to advanced practice. I know in the UK they've they've got uh, radiographers that read reports, uh, read chest X-rays, and what have you. Uh, and the Americans had the nuclear medicine event, so she went for it really well, and then it sort of plateaued a little bit when they weren't able to get extra funding. So a lot of technologists didn't think the need to become a physician assistant if it wasn't going to be a commensurate with an increased remuneration. I know Canadians are looking at it, um, and in Australia, hopefully through RAINS, I know we're doing some activities in relation to advanced practice, but we'd really like to have some sort of federal recognition of those, those skill sets going forward, because as I said before, um, in particularly in the regional areas, I think we can fill a major gap and there is an argument to pay us to do that. Um, this just completely just uh, is into as a continuity of my slides, but I've got to put a shout out to this guy, Nat Lenzo, who we ate at this restaurant years ago in Malaysia, but without Nat, I couldn't have gone to the next step. So Johnny got me into um, advanced practice in many respects and going out in the bush and, and Nat Lenzo, um, and there's Julie Crouch, some will know, has been extremely uh, supportive in trying to improve uh, regional healthcare. He also works as a general physician. Um, uh, this was actually, I mean, just for a bit of a, uh, a digression, this was the Italian uh, ambassador and his wife. This was the local drug dealer in Malaysia. This was the cardiovascular surgeon and the wine, wine uh, merchant. We all went out for a big night out. I think half of the people there are in jail. But the reason I bring that up is because Nat had a great time. Anyway, so um, basically, what we've done recently is moved into this practice here and I've been quite conscious to try and uh, implement uh, some indigenous influences in our practice because one thing that certainly became apparent very early on in my career in Kalgoorlie is that, that notion of paternalism um, and of invasion uh, and of us being, um, uh, of, of, of of, you know, it, it, it is very, very difficult sometimes with certain patients, particularly from the lands, to have it to, to gain their trust and saying that we're here to help you rather than just force uh, force yourself on them, as it were. Um, well, I've always told Jack and Laura and other people that work with us that give the patient two or three minutes to explain their story. It's been very important to let them tell you their story and feel as though they can feel as though they've had some engagement. And these, this artwork is from the local um, Indigenous artist who's quite well known and, and they speak to healing. Uh, and uh, this one in particular actually interestingly came through someone up in the Pilbara that my wife organised, she works um, with a mining company and a lot of Indigenous people got quite angry that this one was introduced which we felt embarrassed about because it wasn't part of their, of their mob as they, they, they call it but in any event um, we got through that and um, obviously we're still we're allowed to use uh, the Infineas uh, which is a solid machine, thanks Matt, Matty Ayres, that's the one that he donated, and also we have quite a good ultrasound service as well. And so we enjoy this, I have a great engagement with a lot of Indigenous people that advance heart disease, this was someone who gave his permission to be shown through the Ansto videos. Um, and just now to the logistics, so Jack was up there on Monday, um, as you all, in Western Australia, the, the Lucas Heights thing fires up on Sundays, Jeff would know more than I, but we get it flown out uh, Sunday night. Usually it arrives about one o'clock in the morning, the generators. It goes to the GMS in Osborne Park during the, about three o'clock. Um, they then uh, prepare the isotope, sorry, prepare what we want is just basically the bolt techie in our cold kits. Uh, gets to the airport at 3 a.m. We tried this plane for a while, but the dinner service was pretty bad, so we went to full service. Um, that's my little joke and hopefully someone got it. Uh, Kalgoorlie is about 600 kilometres away, uh, Gerald 400, Albany 400 and Busso, we, we have someone living there, Lisa, who's great, but we fly to these sites. 
Well, actually, I'm driving there tomorrow morning. I've got a 3 a.m. start uh, because Qantas isn't flying there right now. So to help these patients, we've got a four and a half hour drive in front of us. I'll pick up the isotopes and uh, do 15 patients, stay the night and then drive home. Um, and that's been a nightmare in the last couple of weeks. And hopefully Virgin will ramp up its uh, regional flight service again. This is um, what I look forward to Monday morning. Uh, I'm an early riser, but I always check my email and this falls into my inbox about 4.30 and tells me that GMS has dropped off the isotope at the airport. Uh, because if I don't see that at 4.34, I tend to panic a little bit. Um, it means it's barcoded and it's been logged on. This is all the paperwork they have to fill out. It's got to get there by 3.30 to get the six o'clock flight. Um, and uh, it just takes one, you know, crew, crew not, you know, usually there's, there's three regular people on a rotation, it takes one of them to be sick or on a holiday and get a new person and we've got problems. I had, I've, I've, in, over, over the 20 years, I've only had five major problems where isotope has actually been left on the tarmac. Uh, I had to call Hazmat uh, because they couldn't find it and reactive isotopes in the airport is not a good thing, particularly post 9-11. Back in the early days, there wasn't all this paperwork, but uh, all that has to be ticked off and then I get my email and then I follow it all the way through. We used to have to, uh, when we hop onto the plane, talk to the pilot, li li you know, knock on the door uh, and the, CS the, the, the cabin service manager, the CSM, uh, and we got to know them and they'd say, yeah, no, I've got it on the knock sheet, they call it, um, and everything was fine. But we don't have to do that now if I get my, bar, my, my code. And then we, we uh, land. Um, Here's me looking in the rural attire for the, for the effect of the cameras. Uh, and um, we get our little canister, which is, if anyone knows their guns, that's a 7.62 millimeter uh, ammo case that was used in Vietnam uh, by the Australian Army, but that's what GMS used for a while. And that's where they all say the canister comes in. We have, to, we have to sign for it. There's a little bit of paperwork, otherwise he can't hand it over. So it's quite regulated. Um, and just lately, we've been really enjoying uh, having medical students from the rural clinical school uh, join us. I don't know what it's like for other colleagues out there, but it always surprises me how little registrars and interns know about nuclear medicine. It doesn't ever seem to be a feature of, of undergraduate medical school. Uh, and we've been um, participating in training them and really getting their hands dirty. So they take medical uh, histories. Uh, they uh, get involved in um, obviously just hit the cannulations. The students are just hungry to get their hands dirty because these are fifth years. This is Taz and Josh, two of the smartest young kids I've come across, and this bullfed is me. And and basically, we um, get involved in the stress test, and then they see the journey of the patient from the A to Z. What brought them here, and what what happens. And I try to teach them where I, I get I guess proud of our profession is where a sliding door moment has occurred. So that is that the patient pre-test was going likely that way, but because of the intervention of the nuclear medicine, they went that way. And I think that's where our greatest value um, resides. So this is a great example that Jack did on Monday in a 65-year-old uh, gentleman who had a stent back when he was in his 40s, got his pills <laughs> and seen a cardiologist since. Um, he's a gold a prospector, tough as nails. Um, but didn't seem to need to see his doctor regularly after a stent. But anyway, managed to get through for a couple 20 years or so. And I guess some of you might know your ECG. He's got a bit of a prolonged uh, PR interval uh, and, uh, but other, and a bit of a flat T waves and the ABL. And there's probably other features there that if there's any precisions on there will correct me on. But overall, sinus rhythm, okay, to do the stress test, which we do uh, with the uh, Royal Flying Doctor Service doc comes along. Um, and not long into the stress test, we get that. Uh, with a little bit of chest tightness and a drop in blood pressure from 115 down to 90. So that's not a good look. When you're exercising somebody, if you get involved in stress tests, and it starts going down, you pull out. The, uh, the cutoffs are three, more than three mil of ST depression generally or, or reduction in systolic by 20 or 30. So obviously we stop, check the tracer, um, and hopefully you can see that some you know, ST elevation 31, you've got some severe ST depression that way. Um, and put him on the scanner pretty quick. He's quite happy. Chest pain really for him was a three out of 10. He's been having a lot. He's obviously stable angina. Didn't need, he didn't think it was sufficient enough to get his little pink bottle out. Um, so he must have been seeing a doctor get his repeat um, prescriptions. And you've got a transient ischemic dilatation of 1.54, which is our normal. So his heart's bigger at stress than it is at rest. And this is his stress uh, perfusion 
shows hyperperfusion of the basal anterior wall, so the apex, which comes back uh, in the resting. And then when you look at the, uh, the slices, obviously the inferior wall is out to lunch, so it's the original infarct, presumably. But he's got some reversibility here, but he, you can see his chamber is large. More importantly, his ejection fraction that stresses 30%, and at rest, it's 55%. So what he was experiencing here was cardiac decompensation. You know, there was so much diffuse hyperperfusion, the pump was starting to stop. Uh, and I think we dodged a bullet in that one. But anyway, fortunately, we are right across the road from the emergency department. And this guy came in as an outpatient. Uh, he wasn't to see his doctor specialist, because his GP seemed to a specialist, for nine weeks. Okay, so what we do as a technologist uh, is Jack gives me a call, we put a template report done, get in contact with, uh, with our physicians and we're on the blower straight away, the emergency department who know us and that patient, so what day is it now? The patient had his cabbage today and we did this on Monday. So that was really, no, no, no his cabbage is tomorrow, sorry, he had his cat today. Um, so that's where we really played a role in this guy's life um, and I find that really rewarding. You know, we're a small cog in the, in the whole wheel of life but I think that was an important part where we actually could really participate in, in the medical management of this patient and had he not had the nuclear and there's no stress echo, there's no cardiac CT, there's no basic usage, uh, stress test. We do all that in Kabuli. Um, uh, there's none of that available to patients privately. So, and this goes, we, we've been doing this since 2003. I, I wrote a paper about this, um, <laughs> where we just using a laptop, and this is before you could take a photograph with your iPhones and you could send off reports. Uh, images and ECGs to you know subspecialists immediately. We didn't have that in those days. You had to use your laptop and your and your uh, dial-up mobile to send stuff around on, on laptops. And we wrote about that. And we still see these kind of uh, trends where um, we we see significant changes uh, in about you know sometimes 50% of our cases are usually abnormal, which is very high per capita. We have really I think tight selection criteria. And of that, a significant amount end up like that fellow I've just shown that we sent to Perth. Um, this is another, you know, patient um, uh, who was, I think, a 62 or 63 year old lady that was two hours out of Kalgoorlie, further out into the scrub, where a town, a population of 5,000, a mining town. Um, she was complaining of increased back pain uh, and went to emergency, the nurse's station, sent her home over, you know, it's over a 12 month period, went to emergency. They did a CT scan, found that she had a uh, compression fracture, sent her home, but the pain was worsening and she was just showing a, a sort of a general malaise, which sort of didn't fit the clinical picture. That doctor uh, had a bone scan herself and she, because uh, she was worried about um, uh, an aggressive disease. And so I got the opportunity to teach her because she'd only been in Australia two months, uh, two weeks as an OTD from um, Borneo, uh, Myanmar. So um, anyway, she so sent her on for a bone scan. Um, this lady was in a lot of pain. Uh, I was actually there that day and I said, we'll do a whole body blood pool because we could and it's good fun to do anyway if you can at the time. And uh, you can see obviously this increased hyper hyperemia in the uh, ends of the long bones, which is not a good sign. A uh, bit of increased uptake there. Uh, had the delayed images and obviously you've got some significant uh, diffuse osteoblastic disease, which wasn't detected on the CT scan, which was obviously localized. And presumably, her fracture was a pathological fracture. But again, this is where your advanced practice skills come in. That's a problem. That particular hot spot on the proximal femur is a problem for pathological fracture. Uh, I, I just looked over, over the years, got used to just ringing up the orthopedic surgeon. I know who's going to be looking after this patient if we do send them down and say, look, there's a potential here for a patient for a prophylactic nail. And they've got this cri uh, criteria that they determine whether that's necessary or not. Share that. She did have the, the femoral nail, although you know, obviously she's going to need some significant um, maybe you know treatment, but maybe it's going to be palliative care. But you certainly don't want her to have um, a neck of femur fracture because that would impair her quality of life, you know, dramatically. Uh, and another example of a fellow who was actually a very fit-looking fellow um, who developed this pain in his right thigh, uh, and um, for some reason the GP who just wanted to rule out an aggressive process did a blood pull and I just noticed this was a bit odd. You know, you obviously get the, uh, the degenerative arthritic changes. This is, a, I think, a 55-year-old fellow or in that range. We have this little hot spot here. Uh, obviously, these are just, you know, wear and inflammation and just getting bloody old. But that one there didn't look good and certainly that one didn't. And his, his pain 
you know, uh, we thought was, oh, you just had some bilateral. When you start seeing that, you know, the scanner move up, and think, oh, it's bilateral fast facetal arthropathy. That's the cause of his issues. But you start seeing these worrying sites, and that's a bit brighter than just standard dish. Uh, and, and certainly that isn't good, particularly in the absence of, no, of, absence of trauma. Um, and so we then uh, obviously provide the 3D imaging and you can see here that it's not facetal, it's more anterior, it's in the vertebral body. So that again, you know, gives a risk of this is probably pathological, uh, sorry, um, aggressive disease. Um, and he ended up uh, having, um, that was lung wasn't prostate but in any event as the primary but we were able to to again ring the clinician on the day send him over to ED they do a fine slice CT just to look at the integ uh, the architectural integrity of that of that area of the bone um, and I don't know whether he had a nail or not but at least we were able to alert the medicos because he could have just got up you know reading a book on the couch and bang that would have been extraordinarily painful so I, I, I like the fact that we really get involved yeah sure the report will come out the next day or the day after, you know, hopefully the next day. Uh, but on that day, we're able to send him straight to ED and get his care immediately um, initiated, which I think is very, very good for the patient. So um, I've gone through that pretty quickly, so I do apologise. But where are we going with rural nuclear medicine? Um, well, at the moment, I'm, I'm the bucket boy with our horses. So Jack and, um, and Lisa, because we're doing some equine work at the moment, and that's just the filly having a fee, so I'll do a bit of that. I just put that in there for a joke. Uh, I don't know if anyone's laughing, um, but basically here we're getting more involved um, with trying to bring virtual specialists to Kalgoorlie. If we can't bring in there physically, we want to bring in there virtually and then we educate the GPs on the advantages of nuclear medicine, which is a really great tool, as you all know. But you really got to bring the message out there amongst the primary care doctors and also some of the OTD specialists that, that work in, in our area in Perth. Um, and so I'm spending a fair bit of time working uh, with Rotary, uh, trying, to, trying to bring uh, a free uh, telehealth service so that my ambition is for Indigenous patients to see the specialists that we see and take for granted, if you like, the ones where, you know, we, you know they've got significant gaps and then I've been sort of um, talking to these guys saying, look, you've got to try and donate a bit of time, a bit of altruistic work. Uh, for you to, to, you know, for your subspecialists, there's quite a high proliferation of uh, the need, I'm oh, sorry, of, of, of thyroid disease, which I would argue is a little bit undertreated. And so we need subspecialists in thyroid endocrinology, which is right down the avenue of nuclear medicine doctors. So we've got a few of those providing real, I think, top level care, as opposed to the other option, which is through the public system, which has long waiting lists and often quite tired registrars that are really good doctors, but, um, uh, I think we're trying to initiate the process of care earlier using some private doctors for what otherwise would be public patients. So we're doing a bit of that. Uh, and we're also about to kickstart um, some work with, with this group. I'm allowed to talk about it now, which is the Nobody Left Behind uh, International Registry, where we want to evaluate the, the benefit, the efficacy of PSMA imaging with, with, with spec scanners um, in areas where there's no PET, no likelihood of PET, um, but whose patients have a 50% less chance of living five years. Um, so anything is better than nothing, um, in my opinion. And so this, this test is involving a lot of international groups uh, where in third world and, and, and calculably fits into that, that, that paradigm. So we're doing some work in relation to that. So that is the end of my talk. So um, if anyone has any questions,